Hello, everyone. Hope you are able to find us here on Facebook Live. I'm Julie Flygar, and I am the president and CEO of Project Sleep. And I am currently in Boston, Massachusetts, actually visiting with my family. Um, and it's super cold here. It's like 20 degrees. Um, and uh, we are uh, really excited tonight because um, we have a very special guest with us, Katie, Katie Meehan, um, and she'll be sharing her story tonight. Um, before we get started with Katie's presentation, though, um, I just want to go over a few quick uh, announcements about what's happening with Project Sleep right now. So there's a lot going on, um, and a lot of you guys are super involved and super aware of um, all our efforts, but uh, it's a lot. So right now we have the scholarship open for the Jack and Julie Narcolepsy Scholarship, um, which is scholarship slots for students with narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia who are starting their first year of college make sure to be applying for our scholarship and the applications are due on April 1st. Um, we also have a lot going on in the advocacy space. So this past week, we've done a huge uh, advocacy outreach to your members of the House of Representatives, asking them to sign on to a really important letter uh, that will um, help advance the priorities of uh, people with sleep disorders and the sleep research community. Uh, and sleep awareness efforts. So um, we've had such an outpouring of advocates this year actually take action that it's like kind of like a little bit overwhelmed <laughs> us. And, and that is so exciting because that really shows that you guys are um, getting involved and taking action. So thank you that have, thank you to all of you that have been taking action. And, and this next week is our final week of that advocacy alert. So there still is a little bit of time if you wanna get involved, um, reach out to us on Monday, um, and then also, if you have already reached out to representative's office, make sure on Monday to send a follow-up uh, check-in email to uh, see what's happening with your request. Um, and hopefully we will be able to start uh, reporting back on different representatives signing on across the country. So last year when we did a letter like this, we ended up getting 31 representatives signed on to the letter, and that was a huge number apparently. Uh, and so this year, not that I'm competitive, I'm very competitive, um, but I really want to see if we can get 31 again, and maybe we can even surpass it. I don't know. It seems a lot, um, but you guys are, it's all because of your hard work to get your representatives signed on. So um, thank you all for your effort on that. We also recently, uh, in the last month, since our last broadcast, we've announced that we are going to do an event in Nashville, Tennessee. And that is gonna be taking place on April 25th. Uh, we're calling it Innovations in, in Narcolepsy Awareness and Advocacy. And it should be a very special full one day event on that Saturday at a beautiful nonprofit retreat center. And um, I'll be speaking along with Matt Horsnell, uh, who many of you guys know, and maybe Matt's listening that tonight. Um, he is a Rising Voices of Narcolepsy speaker. So he'll be sharing his story live there during that event and um, sharing about his experience with our advocacy. He's been a huge advocate as well. Um, and so definitely if you're anywhere in the Nashville, you know, driving distance anywhere in there, please come join us on April 25th for that event. I still have a lot more to announce. So we have the sleep in that's happening in just less than two weeks now. So on March 13th through the 15th, we'll be doing our sixth annual sleep in. Uh, and so that's this, you know, this one weekend that we challenge everyone to stay in bed for 12 to 48 hours to make peace with sleep and to raise money just by staying in bed from your friends and family to support your experience uh, and to raise awareness um, around the world. So um, we're really excited about that. And um, we'll be sending out the schedule of events soon. So we do different broadcasts and, and different Instagram lives type things. So we're working on putting together a special um, new like list of events for this year. So we'll be sending that out soon. Last but not least, the Rising Voices of Narcolepsy program, our application for the 2020 program is now open. So if you want to apply to become a speaker or a writer, you know, this is now the opportunity to be uh, sending in your um, applications and the applications will be, uh, the deadline is April 15th, I believe, uh, to get your application in and those trainings happen over the summer. Um, I just wanted to also uh, send a shout out to two Rising Voices of Narcolepsy speakers, I believe, that have recently presented. Um, we had um, Annie 
in Maryland. She recently presented uh, for Rare Disease Week uh, at a meeting at Harmony Biosciences, had her come in and share her story. And um, uh, gosh, why am I blanking? I can see her in my mind's eye. Brittany, Brittany, uh, recently presented at a psychology club in uh, outside of Chicago um, for future psychologists sharing her story. So uh, congratulations to those two. I hope I'm not missing anyone else that recently presented uh, and shared their story in person. Um, and uh, this is exciting time because National Sleep Week is coming up and uh, World Sleep Day. Uh, so there's just a lot going on this month and, and I hope we'll be, uh, you know, be able to report back on a lot more people giving speaking engagements. And I think we're going to have some articles maybe coming out soon by some of our writers. So really excited about all that. Um, I'm also giving a TEDx talk <laughs> on March 22nd um, in San Diego. So uh, to talk about sleep health and sleep disorders. So there's just a ton going on as you might, as you can tell, and it's all really great, exciting stuff. And um, so now um, my advertisements for all of <laughs> Project Sleep's different programs are over and uh, we'll move on to our main act, which is Katie's presentation. Um, I just wanna remind people of a few housewarming, uh, housewarming, housekeeping uh, reminders. We are going to be, this is recorded uh, and it's recording via Facebook. So it's a little bit different than how we usually, uh, it's, uh, but it is being recorded. And so um, definitely, you know, when you hear Katie say something that resonates with you, there is some different like and, you know, um, heart buttons, go ahead and be pressing those and showing Katie, you know, love uh, that way, or, you know, writing in comments uh, when something resonates with you, um, share where you are listening from. Uh, that's really fun. So we can't, always, we can't see this live, but um, Katie and I, but afterwards, it's really fun to go back and read all your comments and, and see where you were all uh, tuning in from. So um, share where you're watching from, um, but please know that, of course, this is public. It's going to be a public video that's being recorded and all those comments will be recorded with the video. So it's not probably the best place to share anything private that you wouldn't want to say publicly and just be mindful of that. And um, also, you know, we aren't giving medical advice at any time. Um, we are sharing, um, you know, our story, or Katie's sharing her story, and we will do some basic facts about narcolepsy, but, you know, we can't be providing any sort of medical advice to you, so it's not the best place to be asking questions about your medical situation. We always want to let people know to go see their sleep specialist um, if you have any questions about how to manage your experience uh, with narcolepsy or any other sleep disorder. Um, and towards the end of the broadcast, we should have a few time, a few minutes for Katie to answer a few questions from you live. So um, as Katie's wrapping up her presentation, if you can think of anything you'd like to ask her about her experience, um, please do type in some questions and we'll be able to hopefully answer a few. And with that, I um, am going to go ahead and uh, introduce Katie here and have her get her slides up. All right, so um, Katie, I'm going to go ahead. Can you, can I hear you, Katie? Are you there? Yep, I'm here. Hi, Katie. Hi, Julie. <laughs> All right, so Katie Meehan is, am I saying your last name, Meehan? Yep. Meehan. Katie Meehan is the Director of Career Services for a public school district in the Phoenix, Arizona area, specializing in career and technical education. Outside of work, she enjoys spending time with her husband and two boys, ages six and two. Entering her sophomore year of college, she was diagnosed with narcolepsy and cataplexy almost five years after the initial onset of her symptoms. She hopes to spread awareness of this neurological sleep disorder in an effort to help others in obtaining more timely diagnosis. And Katie, just so you know, sometimes there's a whooshing noise. I don't know if that's, can you hear that? I don't. Oh, okay. It's not always, so maybe it's just coming and going. Um, it sounds okay now, so. Okay. All right, take it away, Katie. Thank you, Julie. Um, well, I am excited to share my story with you all tonight. As Julie said, my name is Katie, and um, I'll kind of just start about life before narcolepsy. So I grew up about 30 minutes north of Seattle, Washington. I've always really loved school and technology. 
As a high school freshman, I joined the Future Business Leaders of America, and I spent all four of my years in high school actively involved in that. I was a part of student government, and I even worked part-time for my local school districts um, in the accounts payable office. So the photo on my slides is from those days um, back in high school when I was working at my school district. Um, I really wasn't someone that allowed things to hold me back. Um, no one could tell me that I wasn't able to accomplish things. Um, but there were certainly times that I found myself feeling like my body was trying to hold me back. As a freshman in high school, I began to notice that I would fall unexpectedly and really quite often. I was always tired. It didn't matter how long I had slept for. Um, and I had enough energy to make it through school and my club activities. Um, but as soon as I came home, I just crashed. Um, my symptoms really began my freshman year of high school. But I can think back to my senior year when I was in student government um, and we had a leadership class. And in that class, we would do different projects on campus and we'd often be running around our student um, council offices. That lots of times acting silly, just getting things done. Um, and many times while I was running around in um, this class, I would find myself tripping and falling. Out of nowhere though, Nothing was on the ground to trip me, and I really had no clue why this was happening. I often thought I was clumsy, and to be honest, that's what my doctor had said. When I went to the pediatrician with my mom for a checkup in high school, my mom had noted that I was lethargic, that I fell randomly, and the doctor simply stated, she's just a teenager, they're all tired and clumsy. For me, those words really struck a chord. Um, I knew that I wasn't just someone who was tired and clumsy, but I didn't know that I should be trying to push this person to help me find more answers. Um, it really became the normal for me to fall multiple times a day. My friends were used to it at this point. Um, people often watched out for me. My FBLA advisor would walk alongside me at conferences and help lift me back up when I dropped to the ground. Um, but my extreme sleepiness really did start creeping in on my social, academic, and work life. It was really hard to stay awake after school, even if I was only working two and a half hours a day. Um, I sometimes get to work, get done quickly, and ask to go home early because I knew I'd have trouble driving on the way home. And while I didn't date much in high school, I certainly canceled more dates than I went on due to my overwhelming need to get rest. When I moved away from home to attend undergrad, again, I wasn't seeking a diagnosis. It didn't occur to me that something was really wrong. My doctor had said what I was feeling was just normal teenage tired and clumsiness. I lived on campus my freshman year of undergrad and a few weeks into school, my residence hall manager, Jen, stopped me in the hall. She and a few of the RAs had noticed that my random falls in the hallway were happening a lot. And they were all concerned that I'd been drinking and they wanted to make sure to address that behavior. I assured Jen um, that I had not tried any alcohol and that this was just something that happens to me. And she assured me that while it might be my normal, it's certainly not normal. And that I should be making an appointment with Campus Health. I appreciated her concerns, but just let it go. It was something that I'd already been dealing with for four years. A few weeks later, I was at a hall meeting and Jen politely asked me if I had followed up with Campus Health. I let her know that I hadn't and just went on with the conversation I was having with my new friend, Jesse. Jessie had lived in the hall with me and had heard that conversation with Jen and asked what she was inquiring about. I let Jessie know about my symptoms. I told her about the falling, the sleepiness, and I even noted that sometimes I felt shaky for no reason. I wasn't ashamed to tell her because I never tried to hide my symptoms. If, if people wanna be around me, they were definitely going to notice these eventually. As I described my symptoms, Jessie really listened intently to me. And when I was done talking, 
even though I'd only known her a few weeks, she then shared that she too struggled with many of these types of symptoms. She had had extreme tiredness, unexplained falls, and uncontrollable shakiness at times. The difference with Jesse, though, she shared, was at the age of 13, she had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I remember being very concerned when I heard this. Also kind of relieved to know that someone else had been given a diagnosis for what they were experiencing, and it wasn't just life. Um, Jesse mentioned to me that she did have a great neurologist and that she would give me his name so that I could follow up with Campus Health and ask for that referral. My conversation with Jesse happened in the um, beginning of the fall semester of 2004. Um, due to a load of full classes and having to now learn how to navigate the world of asking for a referral, um, it wasn't until late spring semester 2005 that I actually sat in the office of her neurologist to have my initial appointment. My mom attended the appointment with me when we and when we arrived at the doctor to um, review my symptoms, he kind of just asked for a timeline and what I'd been experiencing. After describing what I'd been experiencing for the past almost five years, he asked me one simple question. Do you ever fall when you're talking on the phone or by yourself? And I thought about it. I couldn't really think of a time that I'd fallen while talking on the phone or by myself. So I looked to my mom to see if she could think of it and neither of us really could. So um, after I said that, the doctor's reply was really nothing that I could have ever anticipated. He said, the good news is, if the falls are only happening when you're with people, then it is possible that it's behavioral problem that you've developed to gain attention. I was just shocked. I was also outraged. How could someone, especially a doctor, think that I was falling multiple times a day in order to gain attention? When we moved on for the conversation, um, we talked about other possibilities. Could it be epilepsy? Could it be heart conditions? These were important things that he wanted to rule out before we move forward. Um, so um, once those tests were complete, he'd want to meet again and look at additional testing. I agreed that I would follow through on the testing. Before I left the office though, he said very off the cuff, there is a small chance that this might be cataplexy but that's so rare that we're not even going to look at it right now. I didn't know what cataplexy was. I didn't think to really question him more since there were going to be other tests we were gonna do over the next few months. So I left the office, parted ways with my mom and drove two hours back to school. Now this is 2005, so I did not have a smartphone with internet capabilities, but when I got back to my residence hall, the word cataplexy still sat in the back of my head. When I entered the doors of my dorm, which is pictured on the slide, a group of my friends were standing in the front lobby talking. So I joined my friends in conversation and a few minutes into it, a friend walked up behind me and just like very lightly and like jokingly tapped me on the back of the head with an empty soda bottle. I dropped to the ground and laughing, and then was able to stand right back up. This usually wouldn't have stood out in my head. That was a common occurrence for me. But when I left the conversation and went back to my room and finally had a chance to Google cataplexy, it cemented that image in my head for the rest of my life. When I read the words on the screen, my mind flashed back immediately to just what had played out in the lobby. The Words that I saw after Googling cataplexy were a sudden loss of muscle tone triggered by emotions, sadness, anger, laughter, surprise. I hadn't fallen for attention. I had fallen because I was surprised. I thought about the many times I had fallen while near an entryway because someone else was entering the building at the same time as me. And I was surprised to see someone there. I thought about how when I tried running while playing competitive games like Ultimate Frisbee, I couldn't make it down the field without falling multiple times because I was laughing or excited about the competition. 
This statement was the statement that I needed to read. I began to read more and learn about narcolepsy. After my research, I was pretty sure I had narcolepsy and cataplexy. However, something you need to know about me is that I am a rule follower. So I followed through with my doctor's request for the scheduled tests over the summer between my freshman and sophomore year. Then when we finally met back up in July, I was able to find out that both the epilepsy and heart tests he had put me through were thankfully negative and bring up the statement of cataplexy and how this might be impacting me. Here's just some of the details I learned from my doctor um, that day. So narcolepsy is a chronic neurological disorder that impairs the brain's ability to regulate the sleep wait cycle. It affects one in about 2,000 people, which is about 200,000 Americans or 3 million people worldwide. There are two forms of narcolepsy. There's narcolepsy with cataplexy and narcolepsy without cataplexy. Research suggests that narcolepsy with cataplexy is caused by a lack of hypocretin, a key neurotransmitter that helps us sustain alertness and regulate the sleep-wake cycle. Less is known about narcolepsy without cataplexy. As some of you may be aware, the symptoms of narcolepsy include excessive daytime sleepiness, which is periods of extreme sleepiness during the day that feel comparable to how someone without narcolepsy would feel after staying awake for 48 to 72 hours. When I learned about excessive daytime sleepiness, it brought me to back to think of all the times in high school where I'd fallen asleep around five o'clock on Friday night and struggled to get out of bed at noon on Saturday, still feeling like each of my eyelids was a weighted blanket trying to lull me back to bed. Cataplexy, again, is a striking and sudden episode of muscle weakness, and it's usually triggered by strong emotions. Laughter, exhilaration, surprise, anger. The severity may vary for, from the slackening of the jaw to the buckling of the knees, which are the two things I experience the most, to even falling down for the duration of a few seconds to a few minutes without being able to respond um, vocally. The person remains fully conscious, but is unable to speak. Um, for me, I get a slackening of the jaw quite often. And a fellow person with narcolepsy had explained it as trying to speak with a mouth full of jello. And that is the best way that I can explain what that slackening of the jaw feels like when I get cataplexy. Um, and then I also would oftentimes um, get the buckling of the knee. So I would just drop to the ground and then usually be able to pick myself up pretty quickly as long as I wasn't still laughing. My cataplexy is typically triggered by laughter, surprise, and then anger. So if I'm yelling at someone, I'm gonna lose some muscle tone a little bit every once in a while. Um, hyp hypnagogic and hypnoponic hallucinations are visual, auditory, or tactile hallucinations upon falling asleep or waking up. These can often be frightening and confusing. For me, I don't experience these all too often, thankfully. However, this past year, I was um, staying in a Airbnb, and when I woke up, I had to physically check my foot to see that I had not been bitten by two snakes. I had had a hallucination upon waking up that I had been bit twice in the foot, and I fully expected to wake up and have two very open wounds um, from snake bites. Thankfully, I did not but it was one of those things where you just could not get it out of your head um, after it happened. Sleep paralysis is the inability to move for a few seconds or a few minutes after falling asleep or waking up. Um, and it is often accompanied by hallucinations. And then there's also disrupted nighttime sleep. So unlike public perceptions, people with narcolepsy do not randomly fall asleep all the time. Um, the timing of sleepiness um, for a person with narcolepsy is off, so they are often trying to fight that sleepiness during the day, but then will struggle to sleep at night.
In regards to diagnosis, um, when you're going to um, get a diagnosis for narcolepsy, you're typically sent for a 24 hour sleep study. And that includes a nighttime portion and a daytime portion to test brain waves. The diagnosis is mainly based on how quickly and frequently one's brain enters rapid eye movement or dream sleep um, during these tests. In August of 2005, I arrived at my sleep clinic for my overnight study, and I had the pleasure of being hooked up to a ton of electrodes and asked to sleep um, in a room where people would be watching me all night. Uh, felt a bit odd, but falling asleep typically wasn't a challenge for me. When I woke up in the morning, they let me know that then I undergo the multiple sleep latency test. And um, with that, they wanted to see how fast I would fall into REM sleep, if at all, during the naps. The hardest part of this test was staying awake for the two hours in between the naps. Watching TV has never really kept my attention. Um, and there's not many activities you can do with a whole headdress of electrodes on during the day. At the end of that sleep study, I had fallen into REM sleep four out of the five naps that I was offered and I was well on my way to diagnosis of narcolepsy. By the time I met with my sleep doctor at the follow-up appointment of my sleep study, I had done a lot of research on narcolepsy and cataplexy. I was ready for the diagnosis because I wanted to be able to learn what I could do to fix it. What surprised me is there's no cure for narcolepsy currently and treatment options to manage symptoms vary widely by person. These treatment options can include though, wake promoting stimulants um, to help increase daytime sleepiness, um, nighttime medications for, to help with um, reducing daytime sleepiness and also reducing cataplexy attacks, antidepressants medications to decrease the occurrence of cataplexy, scheduled daytime naps to help um, fight off sleepiness as well. And other coping strategies vary widely by people, but they might include things such as social supports um, through meetup groups or social media groups and improvements in someone's general health and wellness through sleep hygiene, diet, and fitness. Of the treatment options that were reviewed um, with my doctor and I, Trying the daytime stimulant and taking naps um, seemed like the best choices for me at the time. While my doctor shared that I'd most likely benefit the most from the nighttime medications, the rules and logistics of obtaining that medication while I was in college made it really challenging for me. So life after diagnosis with narcolepsy. There are many areas of life that had already been affected by having narcolepsy, but by having a diagnosis, I was really able to have better advocacy for myself. Um, so when I returned to school in fall of 2005, I shared my diagnosis with my um, academic advisor. She promptly scheduled me an appointment with our disability uh, resource center and they were really proactive in helping me develop accommodations that could be implemented by my instructors. We included accommodations such as early priority registration so that I could select the class times that met early in the day when I was most wakeful. Um, I had the accommodation noting that I would be able to get up and stand in the back of the class if I was starting to feel tired. Uh, there was a request that lights be kept on if movies were being shown in the classroom or that the movies be made available after checkout. Um, I had learned from my freshman year of college that taking anthropology at noon where they show lots of videos and turn off the lights was not a quick way to an A for me. These were the most helpful supports that I had when I returned to school. I tried using the um, daytime stimulants that I had been prescribed, but those only seemed to give me headaches at the time. So um, it seemed to do the job of not letting me fall asleep, but it didn't give me any extra energy, which is what I think caused the headaches. Um, and I stopped taking them after a few weeks. 
with being more than two hours away from my doctors, trying to live a normal college life, taking a full load of classes, working as an RA and being on call a couple nights a week and trying to stay active in clubs, I really struggled to make time to focus on finding additional treatments to manage my symptoms. They had already become my norm after having them for five years without any treatment. In the areas of social life and dating, I am now married and have two beautiful little boys. Um, but in college, I met my husband, my now husband, um, during our senior year. And we met three years after I had been diagnosed with narcolepsy. And we shared a fairly large group of friends. And those friends were all familiar with my narcolepsy and my cataplexy. And I don't ever recall sitting him down to say, there's something you should know. I have narcolepsy and cataplexy. He just kind of learned about it as we got to know each other more. Like on our first real date at Olive Garden, where I probably dropped my fork four times because I um, was very excited and a little bit nervous. Um, when it came to choosing dates, we had a great Thursday night tradition. My husband was an active gamer in college and was a guild leader for his World of Warcraft group. So this meant that every Thursday night when his virtual team um, met up for a game, um, I would get to enjoy a nice long nap while he played. And then when it was over, we'd go out and grab dinner. We certainly made adjustments um, to the time of day that we went on dates to accommodate for my sleepiness. But for the most part, we still enjoyed the same dates and outings as most of our friends. And the area of work, um, it's one that narcolepsy has really helped me to learn that I need to be my own best advocate. I don't have a formal accommodations plan at work. However, I have found that having conversations with my leadership team and my colleagues has helped me immensely. For example, when someone turns off the lights in a big meeting, I will politely request that they at least stay on in the back of the room. This year, I was also able to get a standing desk at work. These small changes um, that other people probably don't even notice are helping me every day. I also appreciate knowing that I have colleagues who are aware that if they're going to do something data heavy or some deep thinking work that will schedule those opportunities in the morning when I'm most wakeful. In the area of family life, um, the biggest challenges I've faced has been related to determining the safest way to go about planning for a family. After lots of research, discussions with doctors, follow-up visits and modifications to my treatment plan, um, I felt very confident in my ability to treat my narcolepsy while also um, protecting my children from undesired consequences um, when I chose to get pregnant. Um, I worked with my sleep doctors and my OB to really look at, it, could I stay on the medicine that I was using? How would it affect um, the pregnancies? And um, for my personal situation, we chose to have me uh, remain on my nighttime medicine while I was pregnant. And um, during my first pregnancy, we used high risk ultrasounds to help um, look at the fetal development to make sure the medicine was not impacting it. So for my personal self, this worked great. If you or anyone you know has narcolepsy and is considering starting a family, um, please feel free to reach out to your doctors and work with them as a team because it will help the process immensely. For the future, I believe the future is very bright. I am looking forward to continuing my ad advocacy efforts, specifically focusing on helping future medical professionals gain awareness to sleep disorders. I, this, um, just this school year, have had the opportunity to speak to more than 200 medical assisting students, sharing my story and helping encourage them to continue to gain knowledge on sleep disorders in the hopes that they can someday help to reduce the time that it takes for individuals to go from symptoms to diagnosis. Five years was just too long for me. 
and I hope others do not have to wait that long. If you haven't already marked your calendars, you heard it from Julie first, but please consider joining us for the sleep in happening March 13th to 15th. Uh, through the sleep in, we'll be raising awareness to help um, ensure that other people are not um, getting the average of eight to 15 years between their symptoms and their diagnosis and um, that those that are undiagnosed or misdiagnosed um, can hopefully find treatment sooner rather than later. Thank you again, Julie and everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, I have completed the Raising Voices of Narcolepsy program, which is uh, brought to you through the nonprofit organization Project Sleep, which empowers patient advocates to share their stories and improve public understanding of narcolepsy. Yay, Katie. Great job. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I've heard your presentation a few times and it's still, uh, there's so many moments that just, you know, give me goosebumps and, or I sigh really heavily <laughs> when you talk about that doctor. Um, so um, thank you so much for sharing tonight. And I love, 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 I don't know. I just love hearing about people's uh, personal lives. So thank you for sharing about dating and, um, you know, um, what you, you know, went through with your pregnancy and work and school accommodations. I think all of that really brings a lot of hope um, because, you know, all of us on social media, it seems like we all have it so like well put together. I think sometimes it's like, oh, it must be easy for her. And I think, you know, as I've gotten to know you, then we kind of hear the reality, which is it's all these little uh, tweaks you make um, every day um, to make things work. And I just, you know, think that is the reality for a lot of people. And um, so just thank you for being so honest uh, and amazing. Uh, and shared yeah. over 200 medical assistant, is medical assistants, is that the, yeah. yeah. Um, so everyone, if you'd like to send over some questions on Facebook in the comments, we'll try to um, get those answered if we can. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you um, my first question. I'll ask a question first though. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, hopefully we can get some questions here via the Facebook. Um, so you are a director for, I'm gonna get it wrong, but it's educational, remind me what your title is? Yeah, Director of Career Services. Director of Career Services. And that's at a college level or? Um, mainly high school students, but we have adult students too. Okay. And do you feel that your experience with narcolepsy has influenced how you interact with people or how you see potential in people differently in any way? I think I'm often looking for, is there, like, is there something we can do to help accommodate people in any way? And that's what's interesting about our school. It's all career and technical education. So it's students that are coming for a specific career training program. So even if, they're not flourishing in a certain part of it. Like I always try to look for the, what can we do to help them out? And the simplest accommodations that help one person can probably help the whole class. Um, so just trying to look at things from that way. Oh, that's awesome. I just think it's such a good experience to bring to your work. Yeah. Uh, working with other students. Um, do we have any other questions on from the Facebook? Um, we have uh, Tracy, who's a board member of Project Sleep. She's helping to relay any questions. I don't have any yet, but I have, I guess I'll ask you one more question then. Sure. Um, what's it been like sharing your experience? Because I assume these are people, when you've been speaking to these medical assistants, that these are kind of people that are related to this, the school that you're working at. Yeah, so these are students that are um, going through a program to learn to be medical assistants, um, typically juniors and seniors in high school, and it has been really interesting. Some students have not heard anything about narcolepsy, and then other students will catch me at the end and say, like, they've known someone that was affected by narcolepsy, or they know someone who has a sleep disorder, and it really opens up this conversation about 
like as they're planning out their future careers, um, trying to get opportunities to do externships with sleep doctors, or at least trying to take an extra class that would be specific to sleep disorders. And the comments that I get the most on our surveys at the end is that they're just so grateful that someone was willing to share their personal story um, rather than having to read in a textbook about what this sounds like on paper. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> That's so cool. It's just so exciting to hear. And um, you've already like reached so many people that I feel like it's going to make such a difference. And I, I just wonder if it, you know, like it must change how they even see you because it just, um, it, I would gain so much respect, you know, and, and just change the relationship in a much more, like maybe then they would feel more able to open up to you about stuff too, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. That is just so cool. Um, we don't have any other questions yet from the audience. I have one, I have one more. Well, it's more of a comment, I guess. Um, the hallucination about snakes. Yes. Okay. I hate snakes. Snakes are like my like thing that I hate. Are you similar in that way? Snakes don't freak me out, but we have them in Arizona. So we like look for them all the time, but it's weird because I had this dream while I was in Washington, DC, where I would not expect to find any snakes. <laughs> oh, wow. um, but yeah, so snakes, snake spiders don't typically freak me out, but yeah, it just was so vivid to wake up and just, I immediately like had to look at my foot because I just thought for sure it was going to be like covered in blood and two snake bites. Oh, I was just, I mean, because I know I've had one with a uh, cat, a cat scratching me and then looking for the scratch marks on my arms. Yeah. But I just hope all I'm saying, <laughs> I'm both like, that story is so vivid and it's so powerful, but I really hope I'm not going to start having hallucinations about snakes. Oh, no. I, will, I will start blaming you if I do. Okay. <laughs> I hate snakes. <laughs> but um, yeah, that is, that is just, um, that one resonates a lot with me and is quite unforgettable as a story. Um, okay. We have a question here. Um, that doesn't look like it's as much about your story. So um, just a reminder, um, you know, we're looking for questions for Katie about her story. Um, and so um, we have one question here that's asking more generally, are there any support or funding available for those individuals um, that are unable to work at this time uh, until a treatment plan is more successful? So um, I'm not really sure we can answer that on this broadcast. I, I you know, there, I think there's, it would be and I'm not an expert on all and on what kind of um, you know, disability um, opportunities there are, short term versus long term, and all that kind of stuff. So we're not really in a place to be um, providing that advice tonight. Um, but it is challenging, I understand. Um, Katie, would you consider being part of a pregnancy support group? Um, so I can share that with her, so uh, yeah. we can make sure we can connect you to. Um, talk a little bit about your experience. Um, it's so important that people are able, um, wonderful now that there are support groups online for people to chat about their experiences. So um, absolutely, thank you. thank you, Emily, for pointing that out. Um, and I guess that's all we have for um, questions so far. Um, and I guess I'd ask you one final question. Sure. Is, um, someone else asked the speaker last month, and I thought it was such a great question. What inspired you to become part of the Rising Voices? So it was really interesting. I was going to apply. I, so I went through this past summer, but I was going to apply the summer before. And I don't think I just got things in order in time. And then I watched the different like video segments you guys had done. And just hearing other people's stories and like, I also had listened to your book at this point, and it was just so interesting to hear how it affects other people. And sometimes there are like very similar things, like the um, talking about, like, it feels like you're talking with jello in your mouth. Like someone else had said that, and I'm like, yes, that's exactly it. And then other things I hear people say, and I'm like, oh, that's not how I experience it. But it's good to know what what the range is um, and have people that you can relate to. Um, so for me, it was really therapeutic to kind of go through the process. Yeah, I'm so glad you did. <laughs> um, yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad you watched the videos and thanks for listening to my audiobook. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, and yeah, I think that that's just so important that we get so many different stories out there. Um, in a way, I, I still love speaking, but I am quite sick of my story and I just love working with people like you um, and helping other people um, find the parts of their story that will resonate most with people because everyone has such a great story. So, um, so thank you for being part of this, Katie. And thank you for everyone who has tuned in live. Um, we are going to have another one of these next month, the first Sunday of April. And I will, if I try to remember what that date is, I'll get it wrong, I'm positive. So um, early in April, we will have our next uh, Facebook Live. Uh, and so I think for now, we will go ahead and say good night. Um, and hope everyone have a good week. And thank you again, Katie, for sharing your story tonight. You're welcome, Julie. Thank you all for joining. Okay, bye for now. Bye.